So we're going to move into Botanic Gardens and ex situ plant conservation, and we're going to have two people on stage. We're going to have Jack Hobbs, who's manager of the Auckland Botanic Gardens in Manuera, and he's been a member of the Royal Institute of Horticulture since he joined as a student in 1977. He's one of our foremost botanists in New Zealand, and we just signed at 10 o'clock this morning a MOU between the Botanic Gardens and DOC to the role that... Uh, Jack's going to speak about now, and supporting him will be Jeremy Rolfe, who's our botanist in Wellington, a technical advisor specialising in flora on terrestrial ecosystems and species team based in Wellington, who has had a lot to do with the plant side of what you see in the threatened species today. So if I get uh, Jack and Jeremy to come up to the stage, thanks. Yeah, good afternoon everyone and uh, very delighted uh, to be here to have a, an opportunity to talk about threatened plants and, uh, and also to have signed the MOU today with DOC and uh, we've been working on it for a couple of years. Um, uh, Beck Stanley, the convener of Botanic Gardens Australia New Zealand um, over here, has, um, she signed it as well and has been working on it a long time and we were thrilled, weren't we Beck, to, uh, to get that um, that done and uh, thank you to uh, Minister Barry who I've known a long time and if you want someone who's going get, to get the job done I can tell you it's Maggie. Um, so um, oh, yeah. the red one hard. Oh sorry <laughs> there we go. <laughs> Oh, there we go, I think. Okay. Now, um, I really wish all our threatened native plants looked like this. Uh, this is, I'm sure you would all recognise, is uh, Cleanthus pinaceus carcabeek. And uh, it's a species we've worked on for uh, many, many years, and uh, for over 20 years, in fact, with DOC. And one of the things I'd say with the, the new MOU that we've signed, um, it's, it's a framework for collaborating in a more strategic way and ultimately in a way that is more effective for threatened plants. And, um, but we have been working with DOC for many, many years and including on the species. And I'll come back to what we've done on that in a moment. But um, not all of our species look like that. So this um, epilobium or the hairy willow herb <laughs> is one of a number of threatened plants that frankly um, most people wouldn't give a second look. Well I have to say at the Botanic Gardens quite a few people do give it a second look then complain to the staff about why they haven't done the weeding. Um, and, and, and it's a hard plant to really sell. I mean a lot of those plants that aren't beautiful, how do you capture the hearts and minds of people? Uh, when I hopped on the plane this morning the, the woman sitting next to me made the mistake of telling me that she's an advertising executive and for the next 60 minutes she became my unpaid consultant talking about how we might tell the stories around threatened plants that really will engage people. And um, she talked about um, one of the campaigns that her company did was um, guide dogs in New Zealand and she said the way that they really made it work and that really captured people's minds and ultimately their money was when they started um, showing puppies. And people just love puppies. So she said, if you can turn your threatened plants into puppies, <laughs> you'll be sorted. Um, that's, of course, uh, a bit of a challenge with a plant that really isn't as beautiful as many of our birds. So, you know, the kakapo, it is gorgeous. Um, someone said to me this morning that some people don't think it is. I can't imagine how they wouldn't. Um, but some of our threatened plants, like the, the, the hairy willow herb, are not beautiful. But they are very, very important plants and uh, we, we've chatted quite a lot about um, what it is, what are some of the stories about plants that, that really are important and that we can um, create engagement around. Um, at Auckland Botanic Gardens um, our mantra is that we're there to engage people with plants and with gardens, we're, that's what we're there to do. Um, but some plants are more challenging to do that with than with others, but there are things, I mean, there's all those interdependencies that happen. So plants don't sit alone, as you all know. So how do we tell stories about the importance of, um, of, of those connections that plants have with others, other organisms and ecosystems? How the importance of plants, the unknown things that plants will contribute, um, such as the next antibiotics will come from plants, almost certainly. Uh, food and other cu cultural 
values that plants have that make them so very, very important. Uh, this is a, a, another threatened plant in our um, threatened plant garden that does not capture a lot of attention, apart from people that think it is weed. Um, uh, and it really is a, a very innocuous plant. And a, another, just a, an aside, many of the threatened plants that we work with uh, in cultivation, when we put them into cultivation, they actually thrive, and sometimes they spread around quite easily. Um, and which is interesting, and uh, I'll come back to that. But, um, and this is one that's certainly really taken over a large part of one of the habitats in our threatened native plant garden, sneezeweed. So this is a plant that the Asian community has found to be very effective for colds, hence sneezeweed. And, um, and, and that in itself, I think, is an engaging story for people. But even better is this. It works even better when taken with wine. I've got to tell you, I've been looking for this all my life, medicine that is better with wine. And so there is a story that, um, again, that marketing people can take and, and hopefully can res it will resonate with a lot of people. I'm pretty darn sure of that. So some of the projects that we have worked with Doc, just to show you how botanic gardens can function, and I have to say I'm speaking on behalf of all the botanic gardens in the country. Um, so Wellington Botanic Gardens, Christchurch, Dunedin, also Pukekura Park, Hamilton Gardens and Eastwood Hill Arboretum. We've all signed up to this MOU and um, the kind of things that we can offer, I think this project is a good il illustration of what we can do. So uh, this is Euphorbia glauca, should say shore spurge, and it was considered extinct on, on the Auckland mainland. So regionally a very, very threatened plant. And in the mid-90s, uh, John Wotherspoon from DOC uh, found one plant growing on Browns Island, which obviously had huge significance. And uh, so Beck, who I think was working for Doc at the time, and John went to Browns Island um, and took a ladder. Um, apparently John said, you're smaller, you can climb the ladder, so up Beck went, and took cuttings because this plant was not flowering in the wild and therefore it was not seeding. Um, and those plants came back to the Botanic Gardens and are in our ex situ collections. And I'm going to talk a bit about ex situ because that is the work that Botanic Gardens can do so effectively. So this is in our car park. When you arrive at Auckland Botanic Gardens, you're going to see Euphorbia glauca in one of the main uh, islands as you come in, along with some other threatened plants. And um, this is basically a seed orchard. And in cultivation, this plant that in the wild will not flower and seed is flowering very abundantly. And so what it means by having that um, collection in such an accessible place, we can harvest seed and we have developed techniques for harvesting. So this is a, a plant that the seeds pop and they will go a meter or whatever away from the parent plant. Um, but our staff have developed techniques for collecting whole seed heads um, putting them in strings, bags, and um, holding them until the seed is dispersed. And so they've captured the seed. Uh, and so that is, a, that is why, in, in many cases, ex situ cultivation is so effective. Um, it's much easier than doing things in habitat, isn't it? I mean, obviously. And, uh, and we have arrangements with um, others, even with NZ Transport uh, NZTA, uh, to not plant other forms of Clianthus punicius um, because that would potentially contaminate the purity of our population. So we can provide genetically pure seed, and I'll come back to where we provide that too. Um, advocacy is a really important thing. Most botanic gardens, we, we attract around a million visitors a year, and that would probably be the average that botanic gardens in this country attract. So it's a lot of people, but how do you engage them with the importance of threatened plants. And one of the ways that we've done it is through our threatened native plant garden, and this is it here. Um, 15 different habitats, um, and each of those habitats are, are really kind of a microcosm of, of a wild habitat. They're a, a replica, they're not real, but people can look at them and they can recognize what they are. So they'll look at that and they'll go, okay, that's a shelly beach. And what we do is we tell a story about one plant in each of those habitats. In this particular habitat, we tell the story around Euphorbia glauca. 
and we keep them very simple. What we're trying to do is make that instant engagement with the 80% of people who come along that are not particularly looking for information, but might be interested if they happen to pause and read something. And we do a whole lot of stuff around social media and all that kind of thing as well. So just a little more about Calanthus punicius. So uh, again, in the, in the 90s, um, Doc came to us and said that the last known wild population on Motorimu Island in the Kaipara Harbour, um, they required some help with. Um, and since that time, we have been holding collections, ex situ collections of plants from that island. And, um, and we've also seed banked seed. We tell stories around it. Um, and so, again, it's been a very good collaborative partnership with DOC, and, and germplasm has been provided for restoration of that population back on Motorimu Island. And so we would like to see more of this kind of ex situ work happening. And, um, and, and the other thing that we do a lot of that I've alluded to is seed banking. We have agreements with the Millennium Seed Bank and with the New Zealand Indigenous Flora Seed Bank that you just heard about. And uh, so we, sub we have agreements with both. And um, there you can see on the, uh, the left of the screen is um, Paul Smith, who uh, is n he was head of Millennium Seed Bank. He is now the head of Botanic Gardens Conservation International. Uh, and Philippa Crisp, who was New Zealand Plant Cons Connect Conservation Network president of the time, signing the agreement that the Botanic Gardens in New Zealand also signed. And um, so there's protocols around what we do. We provide seed, minimum 10,000 seed per collection. Um, and we abide by the protocols of the Millennium Seed Bank. And uh, again, it's a very efficient way of ensuring the survival of, of plant species and has huge potential for things like myrtle rust too which I'll come to very shortly. This is the global strategy for plant conservation target eight that as botanic gardens uh, we contribute to. So 60% of threatened plant species in accessible ex situ collections. Um, and as you can see further down, 10% of them included in recovery and, and restoration programs. So that is what we support. Um, I don't think I will talk too much about this, excepting to say that different threatened plants, this is a regionally threatened mistletoe, require different responses. Um, so when this was brought to our attention, it was in Miranda, uh, the first thing that we needed to do was not propagate the mistletoe, it was to propagate the host plant, which in this case is Prosma propinqua. That program has been running for um, 20 years, it's very successful. That, population on the roadside in Miranda has been successfully restored. We've also established a population in a regional park and back at the Botanic Gardens. Uh, this is something that Wellington Botanic Gardens are doing a lot on. Uh, Riwi Elliott um, from Otari Native Botanic Garden, he is the expert on it. But again, what it shows is what Botanic Gardens can bring to this partnership, which is expertise in cultivation, how to cultivate a plant that's very difficult to cultivate. Um, sorry if I'm rushing a bit, I've just got a couple more slides and I've got about a minute to go, I think. So, some plants do have great amenity potential, Muhlenbeckia astoni, uh, Lower Hutt Council about many, many years ago um, really uh, led the way on this. Uh, I remember Tony Silbury, um, he planted it in Traffic Islands and I remember doing a story when I was working on Maggie's Garden Show with the late John Sawyer, fabulous story about this particular species in the islands around Petone. Um, so we're using this threatened plant in a way that really resonates with people. And uh, we think others, such as Pomoderis hamiltonii, have that potential as well. We use art. This in our threatened plant garden is an artwork. Um, so it's a, a, threatened, a threatened plant represented in art. And it enables us, again, to, to create stories and engagement that otherwise wouldn't happen. And the same with this in our threat. This is um, tuna. Uh, the long fendel, which is a, a threatened species, of course, and it's in our threatened native plant garden, because we want to show uh, the connections between these different organisms that actually occupy similar ecosystems. Myrtle rust, just very, very bl briefly. We've been a, a sentinel, uh, doing sentinel surveys since 2014. Uh, Beck has undertaken those monthly. MPI does them quarterly. Um, and we can contribute, if myrtle rust spreads throughout the country, 
we have worked on a lot of previous incursions in terms of identifying within particular genera resistant species, bringing our propagation skills to a recovery program. And that, I'm afraid, is all the time that I have, excepting to say, please come along to open days at Botanic Gardens somewhere near you uh, on the 28th of May. This is happening right across Aust Australasia. Um, and uh, the focus, again, will be on conservation, fundamental to why Botanic Gardens exist. Thank you. Oh, I'm not alive yet. The reason I sat up here with Jack is because I'm just talking very briefly, starting on a five minute warning right from the moment of go. Um, ah, there we go. So I'm just going to give some context about what's going on in the natural environments uh, um, for plants. It's, it's not as optimistic as we've been hearing this morning about uh, things with birds and other species, but nevertheless, I'm pretty optimistic about the ex situ um, agreement that we're developing with, well, we have signed the MOU with the gardens and we are, one of our first joint tasks is to develop a, a strategy and a program for doing ex situ work. I'm going to give you uh, a sneak preview. Uh, Minister Barry this morning mentioned that we're working at the moment on the threat classification of vascular plants, that's our flowering plants, our conifers, ferns, lycophytes. So the numbers that you see there are a little bit different from what is in the um, threatened species strategy because this is the unpublished work that will be coming out over the next few months. The important thing is the bottom two lines, that in the last four years, there have been 12 of our threatened species that have got worse, and 13 species that were previously in our declining or at risk category have now moved into the threatened category. So that's pretty concerning from a plant point of view. Remembering though that we have a lot more plants to worry about. So I think our bird fauna is uh, between 450 and 500, and speci 500 species, and that includes the exotics. That figure of 2,768 that we've assessed are only the native species. So very quickly, I'm focusing on four key problem areas. The browsers are pretty obvious and self-evident. I particularly want to mention hares and rabbits because we really lack effective tools to manage those species at, at grand landscape scales. And so it's a, an especially significant problem, for example, our endemic broom species from the eastern South Island dry country. So there we have some real issues, which is why we want to go back to ex situ work. Similarly with weeds, and Keith gave us a good story about what's happening with wilding pines and the fact that they do become ecosystem transformers. But a particular issue when we're managing a lot of threatened species is that the weed problems are at a very localised scale and dealing with them is often people getting down on their hands and knees and actually hand picking out the weeds around the threatened plants. And that's because, as Keith pointed out in his slides, a lot of those threatened plants are very small things. Habitat loss, of course, is a pretty easy and obvious thing to talk about. We can talk about the long history, but also the more recent history. Um, it's pretty easy to pick on the Mackenzie country as a very obvious example of where habitat loss has been happening at an alarming rate, but it is happening in an insidious manner around the country as well. And the other thing is apathy. Now, apathy is not a deliberate thing. It's because people don't know, therefore they don't care. And as Jack mentioned as well, a lot of our threatened plant species are pretty small and insignificant. My line usually is, they are the things that only their mothers would love. And that's pretty much how it works for a lot of the threatened plants. So I'm going to just tell a story now about Rata Moiho or Bartlett's Rata. You can see the figures there speak for themselves. We are now down to a wild population of 12 mature trees in the far north. 
There are hundreds of trees in cultivation, but they all stem from only two genetic parents. And in fact, amongst the 12 wild trees, there are only five genetic parents available to us. And these are species that cannot, or must, sorry, breed with distant relatives. They will not self-pollinate. They will not effectively pollinate their close relations. And so that points to why we need the ex situ work, the seed banking work, and of course, because Rata Maihau is going to be a sentinel species for the myrtle rust response, it leads us on to a very pressing issue today.